I'm going to say welcome again to Ottawa Swordplay's first uh, virtual open house. And we're going to start things off with uh, just a little quick introduction to all of our instructors. Uh, so I'll start the round and then we'll pass it around to everybody. Uh, my name is Marla. I'm one of our instructors here at Ottawa Swordplay. Uh, one of my favorite things to teach is uh, people who are brand new, who uh, have never uh, held a sword before. I really love getting someone uh, up to speed with how we do things here at Ottawa Swordplay. And I also love teaching wrestling. That's my, uh, my big uh, thing that I like to do. Uh, I'll pass it over to uh, Matthew. Matthew, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello, so I'm Matthew. Uh, uh, so I also uh, love all things sword play. Uh, I love to compete. Uh, I love to, uh, as Mar 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 Marla has said, I also love to teach wrestling and uh, to do the med medieval wrestling. Uh, but I actually enjoy uh, just about every weapon there is, uh, which is, is a fun part of what we do. So welcome and uh, looking forward to meeting people in per person at, at some point in time. You're still mute, muted, Marla. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, we're going to throw it over to Jacques now. Jacques, why don't you say hello and tell us about what you like to do. Hi there. Uh, my name's Jacques. I, I really enjoy uh, teaching novices. I also like uh, being uh, in in the corner, uh, whispering uh, things to people when they compete. Whether it, whether it benefits them or not is a whole different uh, line of inquiry. But um, uh, I enjoy uh, single-handed swords as well as a uh, longsword, and. Uh, yeah, I just uh, enjoy competing. I have Andre, my son, that I get to fight with, which is great in these times where I, we can't get down to the sword hall, but it's nice to see you all uh, virtually. And with me is Carol Ann, by the way. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. I'm gonna toss it over to John. John, do you wanna jump on and say hello? Sure, hi everyone, my name is John Azinas. Uh, I've been working with Craig for quite some time. Uh, my favorite part is being Craig's demo partner because um, <laughs> sometimes he lets me hit him back. Uh, I teach uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, my area of expertise is rapier and hopefully we're gonna try and get a class of that going once we get uh, stuff up and running again. Um, welcome to the open house. Thanks, John. Uh, second last, we're gonna talk to Sean. We're, we've got some interesting audio going on over here, so let's see if this of works. Course. Sure, uh, can people hear me? Yeah. All right, so I'm Sean. Uh, I'm one of the other instructors at Ottawa Swordplay. I, I don't. I find it pretty hard to pick a favorite part because one of my favorite things about um, the swordplay that we teach is is how kind of uh, expandable it is and how you can apply the same things in a lot of different contexts. So I really like when. I get to teach somebody and I kind of see that light go on in their eyes that like, oh, like this is really just an expansion of this other thing that I've known for quite a while. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so last but not least, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Craig, who is our hooptman or captain, uh, our lead instructor, and let, let you kind of take it away, Craig, with your introduction and then go ahead and jump into what we do. Sure. So I'm Craig and yeah, I'm the uh, founder of Ottawa Swordplay and the head instructor, uh, which is not to say that I could be doing all of this on my own because uh, uh, everybody else who's involved is uh, a really big part of what makes this a success. Um, and I like all the things that all those people already said, but in addition, uh, I'm just going to say that one of my favorite things about this is that uh, a big element of what we do is actually looking at historical sources and trying to decipher uh, what this system of sword fighting and related martial arts was. Um, and uh, just, yeah, putting it all together and... Uh, I, I do really very much like the fact that it is a complete system. And although we are Ottawa Swordplay, it's really a whole bunch of different weapons that we use. So uh, moving into the general introduction, and I know some of the people that are already in here know 
know who we are and what we do, but we, we teach a system of sword fighting and related martial arts that was developed at the end of the 14th century uh, by a German sword master named Johannes Lichtenauer, or end of the 14th century, beginning of the 15th century. His students continued to use this system for a long time, and their students and many generations of students um, and uh, we have historical sources that uh, uh, have written down not just what the system was, but how they taught that system. So we teach what they taught, hopefully, or our best interpretation of what they taught. Um, we have dozens of historical sources that we draw our information from, but they are all sort of from the same lineage of martial arts. Um, and the longsword is our primary weapon. The longsword uh, is the sword for two hands uh, in their context, uh, but the system was meant to be adaptable to all kinds of different weapons, uh, both with armor and without armor, uh, and uh, we have sources for a whole bunch of different weapons. Anything else I should talk about in that, Marla? No, I think that's that's pretty good. That covers it pretty well. Um, yeah, so we we start people off. I'll add that we start people off with the longsword because it is the really it's the core weapon that we train with, and it was a, a pretty significant weapon for the sources that we use as our reference. And we also find that it's easiest for most people to start with because you have both hands on the sword. So. Uh, it gives you a lot of leverage. It gives you a lot of uh, interesting things that you can do with the sword. It helps you keep your, your shoulders and your feet and your whole body aligned. Because a lot of what we do uh, is really about the structure of your body and not about your strength. The swords that we work with, um, if you were able to come visit us in person for this open house, you'd be able to pick them up and, uh, and feel how heavy they are. But they aren't super heavy. They aren't um, like seven pound giant ridiculous game of thrones kind of things and they weren't historically like that either they're more in the two and a half to three and a half pound range yeah the sword that i'm holding is about three pounds and if any of you watched the video i posted earlier this week about grip and uh the grip transitions uh i'm going to move back a little bit here so we can see both of my hands but by holding the sword with both hands I can use my left hand to help make the transition into the thumb grip that I talked about in that video. Uh, so that's a really good skill building uh, advantage of the long sword, which then when I switch to something smaller, uh, I understand how to do it because I've done it with two hands. I can now do it with one hand and it just makes it easier to, to go from there. And that applies to a lot of our other foundational skills with the weapons that the longsword is kind of the easy place to start learning it and then you can develop your skill uh, by transferring to the other weapons. Craig, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the Grossemesser? Since I think that's probably our other uh, coolest weapon and I think Jacques might actually have his uh, with him so he could show it off. Sure. So uh, Grossemesser is a weapon that is uh, kind of unique to uh, 15th century Germany, a little bit before and a little bit after, and not much outside the area that's now Germany. Um, and I have what is kind of a small uh, version of a Grossemesser. And a Grossemesser is just a big knife. And uh, there's a lot of theories, ideas as to why these developed and became popular in Germany. Oh yes, Jacques is showing his off as well. Um, and uh, really they were used very much like a sword in one hand would be. They often had a longer handle. This one is quite small, but it's still got a longer handle than a single-handed sword. Um, but uh, it seems to have been sort of a class culture thing, uh, the two main sort of ideas are that uh, there was a shortage of supply of swords and the sword makers guilds and knife makers guilds had an agreement about who could make what. So the knife makers guilds started making big knives that were the size of swords to supply a need. The other one is just that uh, as the common people were gaining more wealth in the 15th century, 
uh, they wanted to have swords because all of the knights and nobles had swords. Uh, and the knights and nobles said, no, a sword is a symbol of knighthood. It's really important. We don't want you having that because we don't want you to look like an important person. So they let them have knives that were as big as swords as long as they were, uh, as long as they were knives. There's no historical source that says that either of those are specifically true, but there's kind of a lot of clues that point in that direction. So. Great. Uh, Jacques, did you want to talk a little bit about your particular one there? It's, uh, it's no, not really. <laughs> I don't have too much. I don't have too much to add. It, it's uh, this is a pretty typical. Uh, this is a pretty typical um, gross, uh, messer. gross messer. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, you'll notice that it has what looks like a, kind of just a curved, uh, she uh, almost a shield for the for the knuckles. It's called a nail, a nail, and it is one of the features of the messer is that this nail actually goes through. I don't know if you can see it, but it there's the 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 the, the tang of this little nail goes through and pins the uh, is part of is basically pins it together so it's just a feature of the the way they they were built at the at the time and as as far as we know and sources being what they are so I'll leave it at that thanks it, if we're no in no hurry and people are interested I have another this is really a hypothesis of mine that I have very little support for um, but uh, one of the things that we see is prior to the Grosse Messer, swords all had very simple cross, uh, cross and hilts. Uh, so they didn't have extra fancy features. And uh, there is some evidence that uh, some people in the Middle Ages considered the sword to be a form of the cross. Um, and then after the Grosse Messer, which is specifically not a sword, or with the Gross Messer, we see the Nagel. And this is the first complex hilt on a sword in the Middle Ages in Europe that I'm aware of. And I have a sneaking suspicion that because this is no longer a sword, it's a knife, that they didn't have that sort of religious requirement to not mess around with uh, doing something funny to the cross. And that let them start adding additional features uh, to weapons. So it could be that the, Nag the uh, Grosse Messer was actually the precursor to all of our complex hilt swords. Um, I would need to do a lot more research to actually prove that, but certainly I have never seen an earlier complex hilt than a Grosse Messer. Nice, very cool. Um, so, let's see here. Uh, awesome, we've got a couple people hanging out with us. That's great. Uh, I want to reiterate that if anybody has any questions, go ahead and toss them in the chat and we'll, we'll ask them here. Uh, what I was thinking we might do next uh, is have Craig do a little bit of a demo that he was planning to do. So Craig is in our, uh, our sword hall at uh, 1760 St. Laurent Boulevard. Uh, so you can see kind of in the background there, some of our armor that's up, our banner that's uh, on the wall there. And normally, if we were having you into our sword hall for a open house, what we do now is give you a sword and a fencing mask and teach you some of the basics of how we fight uh, with a long sword. Uh, and since we can't uh, give you a sword in your actual hand right now, uh, we're going to turn it over to Craig and let him uh, do a little bit of a demo about what we do. Um, so Craig, go ahead and uh, share your screen so that uh, you can go ahead and uh, take over there. Okay, I want to share my screen or just is there do I share my video? Uh, share, your, I... share your screen or no, sorry. I think we'll just leave it done. Oh, we can all see you now. So it seems to be working fine. I don't know if you'll have to share your screen in addition, but uh, we should okay. be okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, if we have any problems, let me know and I'll try and, and fix it. I will start with a little bit of a, a a discussion before I actually show the things that I want to show. Um, obviously, um, we're in an unusual situation in terms of what we can and can't do. And uh, anyone who does any martial art knows that uh, teaching things in person hands-on is much easier than trying to 
do things remotely. Uh, we do plan to develop some resources that will work for new students coming to us. Um, right now, our focus is going to be a little bit more on uh, creating resources that will help people who have already seen some of this up close and personal maintain their skills. Just for two reasons. One, that's easier for us to actually start with. And another uh, another reason is that uh, it will be easier for those people to, to develop those, those uh, or to maintain their skills than to try and develop completely new students. Um, that said, at least watching the sort of thing that we're looking at here should be able to be useful for people to understand what kind of uh, training we're looking at here. Um, now, I know that everybody's stuck at home and has different levels of equipment that's available to them to practice with and stuff like that. Uh, today is the first time I've been to the sword hall for quite some time and I finally have my swords again, hooray. Um, and uh, I also though know that many of you are stuck at home with other people who may or may not be interested in sword fighting at all, but maybe they will be willing to uh, act as a training partner if we can create uh, opportunities for them to do so without actually even needing to know or understand any of what <laughs> of what we're trying to do. And to that end, I actually brought my son Cole with me, uh, who is a good example of somebody uh, who I live with who has absolutely no interest in sword fighting. Uh, so I'm going to get Cole to come over here. Cole? All right, excellent. Uh, so Cole's coming around and he's going to be my training partner for the next little thing that we're, we're going to do here. All right, so I'm giving Cole my fancy instructor's stick. Uh, I will say I know not everybody has a fancy instructor's stick, but you can use anything. And uh, just as an example, oh, look, this is like a broom handle uh, that you can use. A pool noodle is also a good option. Uh, anything at all. Now, uh, I'm going to start doing this with... Uh, my long sword and I'm gonna talk about some other options, but we're gonna move further away and hopefully you will still be able to hear me. Uh, so what I'm actually going to be working on is a foundational skill that isn't really technical uh, so much as something that is just useful to practice. And uh, we've actually been doing this a little bit in class just before we close down. Uh, and this is my distance management skill and how to practice that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Cole to just hold the stick out extended towards me. And I want to have him keep the stick horizontal rather than angled up uh, so that, you know, in case you don't have protective gear, if I run into this, it's going to be here. I'm also pointing out that Cole's hands are a little bit off to the side. Uh, if he's holding this straight in the middle and I run into it, then it's going to stick and maybe bruise. But if it's off to the side and I run into it, then his arms will flex and it will not hurt me so much. So the idea here that I'm looking at is that when I'm managing distance, I want to be able to stay close to the other person but not let them get too close to me. And if I take a board guard with my sword like this, the range that I really want his stick to be in is between my sword and my body here. Now, remember, our footwork is highly variable, and the most clear piece of information we have about footwork is that the market will teach you well enough, which means if you practice, your feet will learn to do things well. Your main focus should be keeping your overall uh, balance good here, but all I'm gonna do is do the footwork that I understand or that feels appropriate, and Cole's just gonna move back and forth, and I don't care what footwork he does, but if he moves towards me, I'm gonna move a little bit back away from him. And if he moves away from me, I'm gonna move towards him. And I'm just gonna follow where he goes. So you can go ahead and so and start moving. And we can use whatever footwork seems appropriate. But my goal is to neither let him touch me with the stick, nor let him get so far away from me that the stick passes between here. All right? Now we're going very slow there. Um, as we get better at this, Cole can, move a little bit more aggressively and quickly, and I can continue to try and follow him. You can see I lost my upright stance a little bit there as we went, which means he was pushing me to a good level. This is an exercise. Cole doesn't want me to be 100% successful, but he wants me to be able to keep up and ramp up as we go.
Now, another way we can modify this exercise is to change what I'm holding. So, if you can speak up a little bit, Sean's like you're very quiet. Ah, sorry. So we'll also move a little bit closer here. Maybe that will help with the sound. Okay, uh, that's okay. I'm not too worried about my feet right now. So if I'm holding my uh, small growth semester here, then the range is a little bit tighter. If I switch this to a dagger, I've got even less space here that I'm trying to keep this in. And then the kind of hardest version of this is that I just have my hand here like this, and I'm trying to keep the stick. Go ahead and move both between my hand and my body. And if I can do that without oh, oh, moving my arm back and forth, uh, it is a better thing. So this is a thing that can we can practice. And you can assess on your own how well you're doing. You don't need me to tell you. Um, although I would say, if you're able to film it and then afterwards look at yourself and see, is my body tilting back and forth? Am I off balance? That will help a little bit too. Um, but uh, being able to always be at the range that you want to be at is one of the most important skills to sword fighting well. Is that good? Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Craig. Um, so uh, you mentioned at the beginning as you were talking about that, that that's an exercise that's uh, a really good option for people who are, uh, who've been with us for a little while, who have tried to do a couple of things with swords, maybe completed our novice class, uh, or been with us for longer than that. If you are absolutely brand new and you're tuning in to this uh, digital open house because you just found out that you can do sword fighting in Ottawa, uh, one of the best things you can probably do uh, to get uh, to know what we do is to check out our website, check out our YouTube channel, and just start looking around because there's a lot of great information on the internet uh, about uh, what we do. It's called under a lot of different names, but if you search for uh, Leek Nauer, uh, if you can, can everybody hear me reasonably well? All right, I'll talk a little slower. I talk fast. Um, there's uh, Leek Nauer. If you search for that, even if you spell it not that well, Google will help you figure it out. Uh, if you look for information about Lichtenauer and his students, you can check out the manuscripts, you can read the translations. Some translations are better than others. Uh, and there's lots of great uh, video of different tournaments around as well. So if you want to see what this looks like at full speed, that's a really cool, uh, cool way to go. And on our YouTube channel, in the next, uh, in, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be uploading some more of the video from our most recent tournament that we hosted last August, which has some fantastic fighting in it uh, using the long sword. I'm just going to interrupt very briefly, um, and I'm actually going to say I haven't gone back and rewatched these, but also on our YouTube channel, there is a bunch of videos that uh, actually I think they feature mostly Marla and I from a few years ago of. Uh, what was then our current version of our novice uh, stuff. And the way that we teach our novice, novice uh, program is a little bit different from back then, but really all the information in those videos is not a bad starting place. Uh, although, uh, I'm gonna go back and look at them. <laughs> it's possible I'll cringe a little bit when I see. Uh, I'm a big believer in constantly reassessing what we're doing and always trying to improve. Um, and uh, I will say though that like, we are definitely beyond the point where two years ago what we were doing was terrible and today is so much better. We make small incremental improvements all the time. But uh, so we do have some novice resources available on there um, and we will make more. Awesome, thanks Greg. Uh, so I think the next thing on our agenda that we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, is our digital content plans. And so we just kind of started to get into that, uh, which is great. So um, we are, uh, most of what we do, we do in person. So being closed has been a, a challenge for us, but we're, we're rising to it and we really appreciate everyone's patience and, and interest and continued uh, patronage as we go through this closure. 
Uh, so we're looking, as Craig said, we're looking at ways to add uh, some online uh, shopping so that if there are things from our store that you'd like to buy, we're going to be uh, rolling out ways for you to buy that online pretty soon. And then you'll be able to have those items delivered uh, to your home, provided that you are in Ottawa and area, uh, since it will just be us doing those uh, driving around and, and drop off of that. For our existing students, the kinds of things that we're that you can get from us, uh, we have lots of our synthetic daggers in stock. So if you don't have your own dagger and you'd like one in order to keep practicing your dagger techniques at home, then that's a, a nice thing to pick up. We also have our Ottawa Swordplay and Points North uh, mugs. Points North is our tournament's name. So if you want, uh, if you need some more uh, things to put your coffee in, we can absolutely bring you a couple of those mugs. On the more uh, going up in, in price point, if you have a mask that you have been renting with us and you're planning to come back and do more sword fighting in the future, you can purchase the mask that you've been renting with your rental discount and we'd be happy to bring that to you. We'll bring you the one that has your name on it if you're already renting it so no one else will be sneezing or breathing into your mask. Uh, or if you'd like to buy a new mask because your current mask is getting worn out, we do have stock of our fencing masks uh, that we'd be happy to bring to you. Uh, and then if you are really feeling the need to train and you don't have a sword, we did just uh, in February get a shipment of some really fantastic uh, long swords from Lance Connect Emporium, which is our one of our favorite sword makers uh, in the world today. So unfortunately, you can't come in uh, to handle those to see which one you like best. But if you're sure that you want one, uh, we can absolutely pick one out for you and bring it to you. Just, uh, so just look for all the information that'll be coming out soon about our online uh, shop. Um, and Craig, I think you had some other thoughts about uh, our sales? Yeah, I also just wanted to elaborate on that last point too. Uh, I know that swords are a very personal thing. Um, and that it would be nice to be able to handle the swords and see which one you like best and everything like that. Uh, that said, the um, current light fetters that we have, uh, before any of the social distancing stuff happened a few weeks ago, I handled basically every single one of them and they are all really very similar. Uh, so like there's not going to be a huge difference between one or the other. There was really only one sword that was different from all the rest and I took that one. So that, that's, that's done. Um, yeah. So, uh, we will be looking at some other, other possibilities for, uh, things that we will be selling. We do have to be careful about some stuff. Um, Marla mentioned the masks. I will say that if somebody wants to buy a new mask, obviously we can't do mask fittings and then take back a mask that somebody <laughs> that somebody wore right now. Uh, under normal circumstances, we'll take the time to fit a mask to a person, but we can't just be sticking the mask on people's faces and then putting it back in stock at this point in time. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to mention that we're going to be, um, as I, we said, we're gonna be cre creating online content for you to practice at home um, and we're going to be trying to make this accessible to people because we realize that everyone just about is uh, feeling the crunch right now and some people much more than others so you know while we're hoping that people will support us and help us keep going we also understand that a lot of our students aren't really in a position to to do that and may in fact need help themselves so one of the things that we're going to be doing is um, if our if our students um, are using our digital content and need something to practice, um, we do have a bunch of these uh, wooden long swords that we used to use as loaners for novices. We hardly use them at all. Um, they're great for solo practice and stuff like that. Uh, and so. 
uh, we're going to come up with a way to make these available to students who don't have a sword at home to practice with. Um, and there won't be a specific charge for that. It will just be tied to the services that we're going to be uh, putting forward and stuff. Uh, so we'll, we'll make this available so that it can get out to you. Um, once everything settles down again, we'd love you to bring it back. Uh, but uh, we're, we're not going to charge you for the loan. They want you to show them the pommel of the fetter. Oh, somebody wants to see the pommel of the fetter. Uh, oh, Jacques does. So yeah, the uh, fetters that we have right now, these were made by Lance Connect and they're kind of a specific limited run. Uh, and uh, these ones were made with a fishtail pommel, which is not very common these days. It is my personal favorite style of pommel for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and yeah, um, these are, well, I put a sticker on, on the shield of mine. Uh, these are uh, a really good value of a sword. There's a few things that are a little bit um, unique to them. They're lighter than typical, and that's why they had to make the custom pommel. And I'm so glad that they made the fishtail uh, version. Uh, but yeah, they're really, they're really nice fitters. Awesome. Thanks, Craig. And for anyone who isn't familiar with our terminology, fetter, F-E-D-E-R, is short for feder schwert. Schwert is the German for sword. So fe feather sword is the kind of German term for a training sword. And it means that it is blunted uh, and that it has, usually they have what we call a schilt or shield. Does yours have a, yeah, yours has a schilt on it. So yeah. it's that piece of metal there that protects uh, your hands a little bit more uh, from getting hit when you're training. There's speculation that the very first fetters were actually uh, sharp swords that were a little bit old and worn out and that they just sort of ground down the lead part of the blade and the original shilts were just where they didn't bother to grind it down, but they definitely evolved into, into their own thing. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, so I think we, that's, m I think most of what we wanted to talk about on the digital content plan. Uh, did any of the other instructors have anything they wanted to mention on that? Do we want to talk about um, what we're looking at for um, like digital membership kind of thing? Or do we want to roll that out with other stuff in a couple of days? Um, I think we can mention that we're, we're looking into, we're looking into it. So, um, all right, I'll just, say, I'll just say this. One of the things that we want to do with our digital content, we will make some stuff available for free to everybody. We're going to make some stuff on a pay basis. And one of the things we're gonna do is follow the model that uh, Valkyrie Western Martial Arts Assembly, is that the full name of the club, uh, uses, um, where we're going to have three price points and it will just be a matter of students choosing their price point. So we'll have the standard version, which would be what the, the value that we ascribe to it and then we'll have a generous version where people can pay more if they have money and want to give additional support but then we will also have the um, uh, I don't know the discount membership version which is for people who are in financial need themselves and our goal here is mainly that the people who do the generous uh, version will offset the price of the or the, uh, the discount that is given to the people that are in need. Uh, and I just, I really want to say that, like, we've had a lot of support from all of our students all the time, and uh, uh, we want to make sure that we're continuing to support the people who are also in difficult situations right now. So we're going to do our best to make things accessible. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. So we've got, uh, so we're, we were basically hoping to hang out with people for about an hour. Uh, so we've got about 25 minutes left in our open house. So I'm going to really encourage people to share any question, questions you've got in the chat. Um, if there's anything you have questions about for how to train at home, uh, if there's anything you have questions about for things that are in the background of Craig over there, he'd be happy to go and grab things off the wall and talk about them a little bit. So go ahead and toss questions in the chat. Uh, we do have one question from Patrick about uh, the differences between 
uh, the Grossa Messer, the big knife, and the long sword. And he was asking, uh, could it be that the more complex blade geometry of a sword was harder to make and therefore more expensive? And the simpler geometry that you find in the knife uh, meant that it became more the poor man's sword. So it was a little bit easier, perhaps cheaper to manufacture. Um, I'm going to say that's probably certainly true. Uh, I don't know if it was a factor in the popularity of the gross semester, but uh, I would almost guarantee that uh, historically gross semesters were less expensive than swords at least initially. Now we do know that uh, the gross semesters became hugely popular and knights and nobles started um, carrying them as well. There's a beautiful one with like gold inlay and stuff that belonged to the Emperor Maximilian. Uh, so like they did become just as um, I don't, ornate, let's say, as the fancy swords in some cases. But yeah, I, I imagine a gross messer was probably uh, at least a little bit cheaper than a sword historically. Craig, uh, still on the messer topic, do you have one in front of you? Uh, I can grab one very quickly. I've got my pawn fair. It'd be nice if we could talk a bit about long edge and short edge. Sure, yeah. All right, uh, so I'm going to stand back here while I'm doing this. So this is my uh, gross semester. And um, uh, we are pretty certain that the terminology that we use for the two edges of a sword come from the gross semester um, because this specific terminology arrives at about the same time as the gross semester. And it's only used in Germany, as far as I know. Uh, in Italian sword fighting, they talk about the true edge and the false edge, which are like the leading edge and the reverse edge. Um, and I should mention that on a sword uh, of any kind, um, the two edges tend to be more or less identical. So right now, this is the leading edge. But if I flip the sword around, this is now the leading edge, right? Um, so with uh, gross messer or what's called a back sword, which is a generic term for any sword with one sharp edge and one blunt edge. Um, there is a, a specific difference between the two. Um, and so you can see here that this one is sharp or <laughs> historically would have been sharp. It's actually blunt, but it would have been sharp for the full length here. And then it's got a short sharp section here. So this is the long edge and this is the short edge. Um, but this terminology became widespread and they eventually applied it to all of their swords, whether it had a, a back edge or not. Uh, sometimes in the gross semester manuscripts, we also see they refer to this as the blunt edge. Uh, and not every single gross semester necessarily was sharp all the way to the tip. But I also think that in some techniques, they actually did thump each other with this part of the, of the reverse edge, uh, especially in tournament kind of fighting and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, the gross semester was so popular that it affected general sword play terminology in Germany, uh, which I think is pretty remarkable. Awesome. We haven't got any other questions yet, so I've asked John to take a little bit of time to talk about rapier, since it's a bit different from the rest of the stuff that we do. Uh, but unfortunately, John doesn't have any of his rapiers at home. So Craig, would you mind grabbing one or two off the wall and we'll have you show them off a bit after John's chatted a bit. All right, handing it over to you, John. Yeah, let me see, I think I'm unmuted now. So uh, Craig is grabbing the, the three rapiers that I keep at the, the sword hall. Um, the one with the big round cup on it is uh, a cup tilt, and that is a, a very, very late period design. We see those starting in sort of the, the early to late, early to mid 17th century. The other two are slightly earlier and are styles that we would see with various types of blades in either the late 16th or early 16th with the knuckle bow or the early 16th without the knuckle bow. Um, the third one that Craig is 
So the big advantage that the complex hilt gives you is the ability to put your finger over the cross. And this creates uh, a much more linear action with the sword where it's much easier to line up the blade with the length of your hand, something that's a little bit more complicated to do with, uh, with more of a hammer grip on the sword. Um, and this creates a very stable structure for the sword to be able to uh, carry across the body. So the techniques that we have in the long sword to do that involve changing the grip of the sword uh, with your hands uh, to a different one that allows a structural difference, whereas the rapier um, just has that built in. Now the disadvantage of that, uh, that fingered ricasso is uh, ricasso is the part of the blade between the cross and where the, uh, the actual guard ends. And it's usually blunt because otherwise you'd slice your finger off. Um, but uh, because of this, what we see is the swords moving away from cutting towards thrusting. Now, this is not to say that you can't cut with a rapier, because you absolutely can. But the type of big, uh, hard cuts that we see in earlier sources start moving away, and it becomes a much more linear action. So at uh, Ottawa Swordplay, we do a lot of uh, single-handed swordplay with the Grossemesser and with Sword and Buckler. And these actions involve both thrusting, because it's a very efficient action, but also uh, cutting. And the cutting um, tends to be uh, arm and wrist-based. But what we're doing with the rapier is a, a finger-based action. So the rapier starts, uh, thank you, Craig. The rapier starts growing in popularity um, for a couple of reasons. One, it uh, becomes very fashionable um, because these are long, thin, fancy weapons with fancy hilts and they look really flash sitting on your hip. Um, and it is just the, the, they just become more popular because it's uh, fashion changes and people want to not use the old fashioned swords that their fathers are using. They want to do something fancy. Plus, we also see that um, the style of sword play is coming in from places that are seen as foreign and, and exciting. So, for example, uh, one of our sources is uh, a guy named uh, uh, Yoko Meyer, and he wrote his book in 1570, and he's talking about how there are all these rapiers that are coming Oh, we, uh, we lost your, your audio there, John. Can you uh, back up a little bit and then keep going about Meyer's rapier? Hopefully my voice is not breaking up too much. Um, we also see similar things in uh, England where uh, the Spanish and the Italian fashions in general that are coming in are very exciting and very popular. And we have people who are railing against this uh, challenge to tradition and, and uh, custom of England, in particular a guy named George Silver, who was very much against uh, the use of the rapier. He thought it was a, a poor choice of weapon. Um, a lot of that may have to do with how he was uh, taught about the rapier, but a lot of that may have to do with his just xenophobia. We also see, Craig has, has brought in some other uh, weapons, where we have the German... Oh, we've lost John's voice again. So uh, I'll say what I think he was going to say, which is, uh, this is what Joachim Meyer shows as a rapier in German. A lot of sword typologists say it's not a rapier at all, it's a side sword. Um, but... <laughs> Meyer, the sword fighting instructor, calls this a rapier, and it is definitely more uh, conservative a sword style um, than uh, what we see in other countries at the time. And uh, this is what he liked to use, and the techniques are actually really similar to Grossemesser. Uh, and then also, uh, this is the sword that George Silver from England recommends as better than a rapier. Uh, and it's a basket hilted. Uh, this one's a back sword, but it could be a broadsword as well. Uh, back sword having a blunt back edge, broadsword having two sharp edges. 
Um, but basically, there was cultural resistance to the use of the rapier in a lot of places, uh, even though they are actually pretty awesome weapons. <laughs> it's very true. Everybody knows the best weapon is the one that you happen to be holding at the time, though. <laughs> That's right. Right now, rapier is my favorite weapon. <laughs> and. So yeah, so um, one of the interesting changes as we transition from these uh, more predominantly cutting weapons to more predominantly thrusting weapons is that the type of movement that, uh, that the fighters do becomes very different. So that when you're looking at people who are doing long sword fighting or sword and buckler fighting or fighting with uh, what we now call a side sword, there's a lot of transition between the left side forward and the right side forward. Whereas when you're using the rapier, especially if you're looking at later uh, fighting, you see them, the sword side is always forward. So if you're right-handed and you have the sword in your right hand, you almost always keep that side forward with your shoulder and your arm extended. Um, and it looks similar uh, in a lot of ways to modern fencing, modern Olympic fencing. And it creates a whole bunch of changes in how the body moves and how the sword is used. So there are still some ways that this can be informed by the uh, German sword play that we do at Ottawa Sword Play, but uh, it, it also is, is quite different. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> I actually was not actually, I was done moving around. So uh, I guess that's all I've got to say at this point. Awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, rapier is a super, super fun weapon, although every single time that I've ever uh, taken a class on it with you, the next day my thighs are just so, so unhappy with me. <laughs> yeah, the uh, rapier is um, in a lot of ways simpler because the set of actions that you have available to you is a lot smaller but it tends to be more athletic than longsword in my experience. Um, maybe I'm just lazy as a longsword fighter. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, so we haven't got any other questions there. So uh, what I'm going to do is now turn it over to Craig, who's going to take some time at the end here just to give you a virtual walkthrough of our sword hall. So Craig, I'm going to unmute you now and you should be uh, on our spotlight. So go ahead. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, all right, there we go. My camera had seemed to be frozen up. Uh, Cole says he's going to hold this as we walk around. Uh, so then we might be able to see a little bit better. But let's go over here, first of all. Uh, so this is our, you know, main entrance, and you can see Rachel, my wife, is at the desk here. She's just helping uh, with some of the technical stuff on this end. Over here is our pro shop uh, where we have the stuff that we sell. You can see we do have quite a few swords available for sale and some other things, a lot of the training daggers. Uh, we have our other storage area over here, shelves for students to put their things on, and then our loaner equipment, so we have a whole bunch of loaner swords over here, and then these are the loaner masks that our students were using last term. Uh, so as Marla said earlier, those will be available later on. And then we have change rooms back here, which through the window you can see Jacques and Matthew's armor peeking out, and uh, our little changing spaces. Uh, the equipment here is uh, stuff that belongs to our actual instructors, and we've got storage space that uh, students can rent to keep their stuff here. And then on the walls around, uh, most of the equipment on the walls is the swords and armor of various instructors. So we've got my swords and armor and John's. Uh, the two big uh, spy handers here are the two swords that are actually seven and a half pounds. That's as big as swords ever got. And then we have Sean and Marla's equipment, all of our loaner swords and pole axes, and then we have Matthews and Jock's equipment, and our foam halberds uh, that we use for pole axe and hatchet weapon training. Uh, so that's the 
majority of the sword hall. Is there anything else people would like me to show? Craig, uh, we were wondering if that might be a crossbow on the wall. <laughs> there is, in fact, yes, a crossbow on the wall. Uh, we don't have lessons in the crossbow right now for a variety of reasons. We would love to make that possible. Uh, I use this for uh, reenactment purposes. Uh, it does have a few modern features which are mainly for safety, but it is a functional crossbow and it was made, custom made for me, modeled on an early 15th century Southern German crossbow. So completely fitting with the time period of the system, uh, uh, the, the time the system that we use was mainly in use. Uh, if people are interested, I could get some of the foam bolts and show the firing thing and shoot it at the wall or something like that. Well, maybe. Oh, I'm getting a thumbs up. All right, it will take me a minute to uh, grab the bolts from the back. So I'm gonna just take a second while, uh, while Craig is grabbing that to mention that those wooden items that are up on the wall there uh, that are crossed, those are called uh, do sacks. Those are wooden versions. We don't, uh, they're mostly for display because getting hit with something that's made of wood is uh, pretty painful. It doesn't have a lot of give, uh, but those are uh, a similar uh, interesting weapon uh, that we occasionally look at the sources for. Oh, and there Craig's got a, a leather one that you, that doesn't hurt nearly as badly to be hit with. <laughs> They've got that nice loop so they can, you can do big uh, swings with them and keep your hand inside the handle. So uh, the bolts that I'm using for the crossbow today are uh, completely modern things. They've got foam heads similar to what you see in archery tag and stuff like that. Uh, I do have some target bolts, but uh, I, don't, I don't have them in place to use those regularly. Uh, so I'm just going to put those on the floor. But essentially when I'm using the crossbow, uh, the first thing is I need to open the tickler, which is the trigger here. Uh, because I don't want it to accidentally uh, go off. I put my foot in the stirrup, and then I'm gonna span it by pulling the cord back like this, and it's just hooked over the top of this. A lot of uh, crossbows, especially combat rather than hunting crossbows, had a wheel nut thing that turned to release. This one has a much simpler pin release, which was not as common, but is historical. So now it's been spanned, and I'm just going to set the bolt in here and um, this little metal clip was mostly a later development that's one of the modern safety things that uh, wouldn't have been on a crossbow of this era but it just helps keep the crossbows from falling off but it's not really held tightly in place and then from here i just want to choose my target and there's a number of ways that you can hold the crossbow it's similar to uh, a firearm um, although some of, the, some of the things that sometimes they did were a little bit different. Quite often they would hold it low like this, but I can also put it up. So right now the tiller is actually sitting on top of my shoulder. Actually, I'm gonna get Cole to come around to the other side here. So you can see that I can put it up on my shoulder like this. And this is particularly uh, useful uh, if you don't have long arms like I do, I actually like to tuck it just under my shoulder here. There's no real kickback in the same way that there is with a rifle, um, but then I'm just going to squeeze the tickler, a pin will pop up to release the string, and that's the crossbow. I said. Um, so, Craig, there was a question. Yeah. Is it possible to remove So we do not 100% know for sure what materials they used for do sacks that they fought with historically. We do know that they used leather sometimes. We're pretty sure they used wood sometimes. There's some people that believe there were um, metal ones as well. Uh, I do know later on people used wooden sticks for competitive combat games that were very similar to do sack fighting. I'm willing to bet that they were willing to hit each other with a wooden do sack uh, in the Renaissance, uh, although we do not do that. Wooden weapons, unfortunately, they're fine for solo practice and some really simple things, um, but uh, in spite of what 
people tend to think. Wooden swords actually hit really hard and are more likely from a safety span standpoint for modern people to like break fingers or things like that. They also don't have any flex. So if you stab somebody, um, it really, really hurts. Metal swords are surprisingly safer to train with than wooden ones for the most part. Also, if wooden swords break, which happens more often than steel swords, they tend to splinter and the splinters can be really dangerous. Um, and yeah, wooden do sacks hit really freaking hard. So uh, yeah, don't try that at home unless your home is in the 16th century. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Craig. My pleasure. So we don't have any other questions and we're getting close to the hour. So I think we're gonna wrap things up there. Uh, was there anything that... <laughs> oh, the crossbows are great. <laughs> was there anything that anybody else Final question about your last chance. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing anybody typing. So I think we're gonna sign off here. So um, this has been uh, pretty fun. Uh, glad to, uh, to have all of you join us. We had uh, 18 participants on this call and we're looking forward to doing more digital content in the future. Uh, we have a Facebook page and we have our website at www.ottawaswordplay.com. Uh, so check there for announcements. Uh, we usually put the same announcements on Facebook. Uh, and we'll be, you can also check out our YouTube channel uh, for that video content that Craig was talking about. Uh, and we really hope that if you think this is cool, because we think it's pretty cool, that you'll come out and join us uh, when we're back open and when we can get back to uh, fencing with all of our friends in the sword hall. So uh, with that, uh, if you have any other questions, you're, you can absolutely get in touch with us. Uh, you can send us an email at info at ottawaswordplay.com uh, and we'd be happy to hear from you. So yeah, uh, from all of us at Ottawa Swordplay, uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you in person sometime soon. Thanks a lot, everybody.